Chapter 24 Peter I held Brooke on the couch until Mr. Atkins kicked me out the night before. He assured her that he would handle her mom's cremation and all the cost associated with it. He explained all of the steps that needed to be done when someone passed, teaching her as he went. It seemed like everything he said or did was a lesson. I found myself wishing I could video his words so I could listen to them again and make sure I didn't miss anything. I was sure Brooke felt the same way. Brooke and Millie were broken, but man, they were strong. Their mom had put them through many things before. As much as they loved her and grieved her, I felt a tiny twinge of relief. Even though the pain was bad, excruciating, it would be the last time she could hurt them. It would be the last time they were abandoned. Brooke and I were finally able to talk as humans about the fire. She showed me everything she had printed off, down to the location of my parents' graves. How did you do this? I asked her the night before. She smiled. Raven helped me. She's my best friend, and she's really smart. She's good at finding the truth. She can even tell if someone is lying or not by listening to their voice. I chuckled. Really? That sounds kind of far-fetched. Well, it's easier for her when she can see their face, but their voice is enough. She's called people out for lying over the phone before. I was one of them. You lied to her? Why? She shrugged. I thought I could get away with it. Now, I know I can't, so I don't even try. She called Raven and talked to her about her mom for a while and let me read her research in private, then came back and let me hold her again when she was done. I told her I loved her again before I left, and she said it back. I meant it with every bone in my changing body. As I walked to the cemetery the day after, I wondered who dealt with my parents' end-of-life matters. All of our possessions were burned, but did they leave money behind? Did someone use that money to bury them and pay for their headstones? Was there a funeral? Did people come and grieve for them? She warned me that my name would be on the headstone as well, but it was still jarring to read it. John and Amelia Murphy. Thomas Murphy. The stone was a simple gray granite, sleek on the sides but rough on the top. It looked slightly askew, but I suppose there wasn't anyone around to worry about whether it was straight or not. Our birthdays and the day of the fire were etched in the stone above the words, forever in our hearts. Hey, I said, unsure what to say to them or how to start. It's me, Thomas. I hadn't called myself Thomas in years. It felt weird, foreign. I actually go by Peter now, I explained. I'm sorry I didn't come sooner. I tried to hide from that night because I thought... I thought it was my fault. Actually, I was sure it was until recently. Something insane happened that night. I turned into a... Well, it doesn't matter, but I thought that I was the reason you died. I even went far enough to think that I was the one who killed you, and I couldn't remember it. Are you even here? I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know what happens after you die. I mean, if you have a soul, and it goes somewhere else after you die. Brooke believes in heaven and God. I don't know how she does it. The girl can't catch a break, but she still believes. I want to believe, but I also don't. It seems like a fool's hope that you could be somewhere else right now, smiling and happy and together, waiting for me on the other side. The idea that I could see you again isn't comforting, it's tormenting. I don't want to believe that's possible only to find out one day that it wasn't. Tears were spilling down my face. I felt eight years old again, desperate for them to hold me and tell me it was going to be okay. You weren't here for so much. I barely got to have you in my life. I don't remember those first few years, and the last ones are even fuzzy. I've tried so hard to forget you because the guilt was so strong, and now I'm clawing at my brain trying to pull up every memory I can so I don't lose them forever. Did you both believe in God? Did you believe in heaven and souls? I don't remember us ever going to church or talking about it. Is it the kind of thing where it exists for people who believe and it doesn't for those who don't? Are you really gone forever? Is there any chance that you aren't? I was sobbing as I sank to my knees, and a memory burst forth from the depths of my consciousness. What's the ring on your finger? 
I asked Mom as we shelled peas from the garden sitting on the porch steps. The memory came back with piercing clarity. I could see the ring with a large red oval on her thumb. Her hair was long and black. She had it pulled back, but most of it had escaped and was whipping in her face when the breeze hit it. It's a magical ring, she said. Do you remember how I told you that magic runs in your blood? I nodded, but I thought she was full of it. I knew the drill. Santa Claus turned out to be a hoax. I'd soon find out that the magic was too, but I wasn't old enough yet for her to break it to me. This ring has been passed through your father's family for generations, she explained. When the person wears it, they can make a wish. Just one wish, and it will come true. But they have to be very careful so they don't wish something on accident. You got to make a wish even though it's Daddy's ring? I asked, playing along. She nodded. Yes, anyone can make a wish. The person who makes the last wish wears it to make sure the next wish isn't wasted. Your dad wore it until he gave it to me to make my wish. I had to think long and hard about my wish before he would pass it on. One day, when you're grown, I'll pass it on to you. What did you wish for? I asked, getting excited and falling into the story. For a moment, I could imagine what it would be like if she were telling the truth. She smiled silently to herself. What? Is it like a birthday wish and you can't tell anyone or it won't come true? I asked. No, Thomas. I wished for protection for you, she explained. Now I know that no matter what happens, you will be okay. It will be like you have a guardian angel. Are guardian angels real? I wondered aloud. Was any of it real? Oh, yes. God sends them from heaven to help us, and now you have one. She leaned over and kissed my forehead. I could still feel the pressure of her lips. They felt so real that I almost leaned into them. She believed it was real, and she gave me the wolf. Or God did. I wasn't sure how it all worked. The wolf was my guardian angel.